you have received a long agenda and um, I haven't received any comments so far, but uh, what we try to do that is to try to sum up what we have done during this nearly one year long period and uh, what we really need to do to um, plan for the autumn. So um, we have set aside this 90 minutes and I think uh, if you can have some good comments from you, we can be very prepared when we plan for the autumn and winter period. So any comments to the agenda from any one of you? Um, I see no sign on my screen, if Jenny see no. Then we can start with the third one, and that is the activities performed since uh, September last year. And um, the connections we have made to people and organizations, um, I think you all are representing a good part of that. Um, the distribution has been uh, very much um, personal by, by personal telling this from Bob to his colleagues in the US and Paul and I here in, and Ersten, and then we have used the web to circulate the information about B2B and the ideas um, to people and institutions we know about. There has been what we call in Norwegian a kind of a jungle telegraph that has been functioning. And, uh, and of course that is something that has been easily could have been improved. So if you have any comments on how we can improve and what we, who we are we missing involved in this work, that's, um, that would be nice to get some feedback from you. So I leave the, the floor open and uh, some of you are muted. So you're aware of that when you start speaking. Ersten, can I challenge you? Did you? Yes, I, I think that um, um, there is a lot of ground being covered and uh, uh, rather good uh, preparatory material being made and uh, and there are very good connections, uh, not least in the US that Bob has uh, set up. And uh, I think, uh, so I think the, the opportunities are, are quite uh, well prepared, but, uh, but uh, uh, we, we can't continue by just talking like this when there should be some uh, we, we need to, to uh, attract some funding and get some uh, active people uh, to work uh, in a dedicated manner. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm still not sure whether <clears throat> B2BI is going to be a regular research project or whether it will break new ground in, in how research is done, which has been uh, in a way, what I what I have advocated is that, um, and that is with, with my methodological background, because in methodology, uh, research and, and uh, services or research and operations are becoming much more are going much more hand in hand than in the in the marine sector, and uh, the way this works is that uh, the the routine operations in the in weather in meteorology is becoming so clever and advanced that uh, it actually becomes a research infrastructure and that means that uh, what the operational agencies like uh, the met services what they do is has such a high grade that uh, it it actually complements in particular research observations and, and uh, you get uh, you get four dimensional fields out of it that uh, that's really serve research purposes and uh, it's just to think about uh, how you know, the European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecast with their reanalysis using data simulation actually has created probably the best available global data set since uh, since 19, uh, 19 uh, 79 or so since the advent of the satellite area has, has, a, has a high resolution uh, atmospheric uh, set, set of atmospheric fields that really shows the uh, quite accurate details of atmospheric circulation and temperature and uh, all the physics and dynamics and uh, 
and in that way one can detect uh, um, one can detect uh, or one can find the the um, the uh, distribution and the probability distribution of any events that that have taken place and over 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 of specific interest like a like a drought period or or uh, uh, extremely wet period, etc. Et how how the uh, probability distribution has changed of events over these uh, 50 years, and uh, in that way, one has a historical record which is much more uh, in, contains much more information than what a research project can can manage to to harvest, and uh, and it continues over time. So it's a 50 year continuous record and and I think that the in oceanography it, it will it will go the same way and I think it's about to get there through uh, through now the global capabilities in in marine forecasting of course this this is for the physics and dynamics and not for the ecosystem part of it which is in a way downstream of the physics and dynamics but it's a requirement for the ecosystem studies that that the same thing will happen for the for the marine sector, and and the institutions that do that do that. That is the marine institutions, national institutions in uh, throughout uh, all the Atlantic Rim countries, and and these institutions they they sit on resources and the service capabilities that that is my impression that the research community has not really linked up to. And vice versa. So there is there is um, land there which is not really covered, and uh, B2B being a being outside of the of the throne of, of of the sort of official structure of how things are prepared has has the capability to to cross these these boundaries and and challenge them. But it's not easy because because nobody likes to to uh, to address institutions and uh, and ways of working which has not been really approached before properly but but in my view sooner or later in the marine sector you will have the same development as in is in the atmosphere that you will have this capability of uh, getting very long high resolution records which resembles the measurements where you have measurements and which otherwise fill it out with with the model calculations, and that will actually show in, in more detail than you can gather in a research project uh, how how the probability distribution of events actually evolve with time. So that's that was a long uh, long story, but uh, but I think I think this. Um, um, this way of thinking has not really been explored before, and I think it, it would be interesting to to try to do it. It, it goes against the, the way research is funded in the U.S., where where research and applications are two different things and have two different uh, two different uh, funders. Uh, and I think that is a real obstacle. But I think this this obstacle has to be overcome and I think in Europe there is more room for it through Copernicus for instance. I think we, we see if, if I can continue, continue we see the same in hydrology where uh, for the last at some stage in the 1990s I, uh, the, the combination of risk science and operations in hydro hydrology was, was broken and the science was left with, uh, with UNESCO and with the uh, ICSU and the operations was left to the traditional governmental institutions and that meant actually that the research support for service development in hydrology uh, lacked lacked the force that actually you got in methodology where this where this link never was broken you always had science support for operations in methodology and very strong science support for it which has been has been to the benefit of climate research and, and weather forecasting. So so this is this is what this is some thinking that, that I think B2B B2B should should actually take on board 
and try to explore uh, because it's it's a it's probably a novelty and it's it is something that has to come and it comes with the extended observation capabilities on the routine basis of the of the oceans like the argos floats for instance and the capability to do uh, soundings with with the uh, gliders or floats that transmit for instance uh, every week their information in, to uh, to, to satellite to anyone that actually can use it, together with the surface uh, observations uh, based on satellites or ships of opportunity, etc., and and uh, voice, etc. So, so there is a growing. Uh, my impression is that there is a growing ability to do observations, uh, also three dimensions, uh, for the marine marine uh, domain. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Very good start. Uh, can I challenge Mark on this? So, so we get the US view and you have a long commitment from the ocean work, um, which Einstein don't have. He has from his meteorological background. So, and also the difference between European way of running re research and observation and the US Canadian way. Yeah, I think Einstein makes a lot of great points. I, I would have said a lot of the same that, uh, Clearly in the US, a lot of, particularly in the ocean, a lot of the research is funded by National Science Foundation, which is much more hypothesis. I wouldn't say it's basic science, you know, in terms of theoretical physics, but it's it, the connection between that and question driven science is sometimes pretty tenuous. Uh, Office of Naval Research, when it was much bigger than it is today, um, used to do that kind of thing. A lot of it was really forecasting. But that's really uh, diminished a lot. I think when I look at the oceans, I'm a, on the UN decades, the US Committee for the UN Decade for Science for Sustainable Development. Um, there clearly is a lot of desire to move towards exactly that model that Oyston's talking about. I think the challenge for the oceanographers is one, there's a, there's a there's 50 years of culture to not do that. So it's not just an agency thing. It's also within the academic enterprise that scientists who do the applications and it's a little harder on the tenure side, perhaps. Um, but I think the other challenge, Royston, and I'm curious, you know, clearly Bjorkness is the, you know, the forebearer of a lot of that thinking of bringing that science and weather forecasting and being a much more question driven. Uh, I think the challenge for oceanography, and I don't think this is just a North American versus or a difference between Europe, is you could show real value in sort of a three to five day forecast. In the oceans, you're really talking months to years. You're really talking that uh, seasonal to interannual. That's a little tough. And what's what's interesting about this, it's it's. Uh, I was actually reading Ernst and Young which is a big firm in the US actually does an annual report of aquaculture, salmon aquaculture in Norway. You may not know that, but they do this. And one of the points they make and is that the fishing industry, both the, you know, the harvesting as well as the aquaculture side are more sort of experience driven as opposed to knowledge driven. That is an event happened and oh, you know, it's a bad year and we'll go to the insurance companies and they'll pay us and we'll, we'll recover that loss. What they're arguing in there is to, to move <coughs> towards much more sustainability, which they look at from an industrial perspective as a branding opportunity, requires that you really have knowledge, which you, means you have the observing systems feeding the forecasting system so that you start taking precautions before a harmful algal bloom happens. Maybe you adjust the feeding so you get your feed conversion ratio because of water quality, or you try and manage it for a sustainability perspective. And, you know, even the U.S. agriculture industry, it's still largely experience. You know, everybody says, wow, I've never seen it this hot, you know, and they move on and not look at the longer term trends. So it's, it's a, problem in both the academic enterprise as well as in the potential user base for this kind of knowledge is to really make a real shift from thinking that a drought 
a severe storm, a harmful algal bloom is a one-off event that you just deal with. I mean, farmers are classic. They're always fighting the weather, but now we're talking about fighting the climate or living with the climate and moving towards sustainability. I think if B2B I takes that big view, that I think is there's a real opportunity to start making those kind of changes. But I th also agree with Royston, we can't go another year just talking. I mean, it's, somebody's got to fund this and it's not cheap. It really, you've got to recognize this isn't just yet another joint global ocean flux study or a world climate research program and a collection of little projects. It's really a, a mind shift, culture shift. So I'll leave it with that, but it's a, it's a great conversation, I think. Thank you. Anyone among the group of 11? Catherine is thinking. This is this is Jack. Um, Good. I guess I'm a. I, I'm not sure that I see this group B to B I. As the as the one that would evolve ocean science in the direction that Oyston or Mark just outlined. I mean, it, you know, Mark just mentioned that Oyston's vision is kind of very similar to the UN Ocean Decade. Which is an, you know is already launched and has a lot more money than we do as a group. And what I I thought was novel about B two B I at least in the you know early when we first started coming about not from the beginning uh, we joined Kathy and I kind of after you guys have been meeting for some months. But the idea was you know really trying to understand uh, what it is that the various stakeholders whether it be fishermen or aquaculture or people that live near the coast what they're concerned about. And what information do they need that is not available? And and in many of those earlier meetings, there was uh, quite a few more uh, representatives from from non physical sciences, and we seem to be getting more and more physical science as time marches on. And I I don't know because that's a good or a bad thing, but you know there's a lot of other groups. We you know we heard a, a month ago or whatever about. Uh, passions and this major effort to do exactly what Oyston is saying, but not for the entire North Atlantic, but just for the Arctic. But somebody, you know, came up with that idea and wants to operationalize a, an observing system. And they, I think they had 15 million euros or maybe dollars, but it was big funding, right? Are we going to compete directly with them or cooperate with them somehow and, and add a new wrinkle? And so I'll just stop there. No, just to say that I don't see B2B to be a project. B2B is much bigger thinking of interactions between the different science in different categories and the link with the users to, to, to create a larger program here. But I agree with your observation that we have lost some people in the discussions from that we had earlier in the winter. Um, there be several reasons for that. Uh, but I think we have to go into note to see how can we fund B2B, because we are lacking this administrative support, so we really can finance what we like to do. And um, Bob has made a try in the US, and I and Paul have tried here in European area to see where we can raise the necessary funding to start moving this. And that has not been so easy. I thought it might be easy to ask some of the rich um, grandfathers around here, but uh, they didn't open up their pockets so easily. So. Uh, we have a challenge here where we can find the financing here and we're on how to organize the B2B. One option is to make it as a foundation here in Norway, for example, or another type of organization in the US so we can handle support and administrations in both sides of the Europe of the Atlantic. So we haven't found any good solutions on that yet, um, but we're still working on that topic. So I'll open up to you to see if you see any other good opportunities, how we could organize this to secure a good basement and a good financing of the work here. That covers both the marine, the social science, the met science, and the users, the private and the governmental. Okay, anyone else? So um, from the United States perspective, NSF has this navigating the new Arctic track for collaboratories that the US, you know, we might be able to, from the US, bring funding from. Uh, Jack, do you remember how much that is for? I mean, it's for this, these types of groups that want to connect research efforts. And I it's, believe it's, it's in- it, I don't think they actually said, right? They said it could right. be 
it, it was open ended. You know, if you had a really big idea, they might come up with really big money. Or you could have a smaller thing, right? And so the call was very uh, non specific about the magnitude of funding, but they envisioned some of them would be really large efforts. Let me make a, a small comment, probably a longer one, a small comment on the Arctic and B2B. Uh, I work in the Arctic and you do not understand the Arctic and the warming in the Arctic without working in the subtropical Atlantic Ocean. Stop. Yeah. Uh, so we very often hear people talking about the Arctic and many of the community gathering here is talking about the Arctic because they work there and you pay a lot of attention what's taking place there. But to understand the thing, the, the, the warming here means that you look downstream and there is uh, very few voices who talk about the downstream situation, for example, between West Africa and the Caribbean, where the formation of the Atlantic water and the warming of the salt is produced. So hereby we now we go for what the Research Council or the Decade of the Ocean opens up for. <clears throat> but uh, we have very little impact on to understand the thing uh, in, in its uh, as an entity uh, in, in its entireness. Uh, so, um, uh, so that is, uh, in B2B, we have a, an, an imbalance, not only in science, uh, but also in ge geography. The imbalance in science and the, lock, uh, the loss of uh, people, of, of the non-natural science people, uh, comes uh, for probably for various reasons. One of them is that uh, natural scientists very often think basin wide, and they will immediately th could think about the entire North Atlantic um, much easier than a social anthropologist or an economist. Uh, maybe I uh, do uh, put some people in discredit at this. I don't want to know. That is one of the reasons that uh, we are, uh, th that is us who uh, talk about this basin wide uh, connections. So there are difficulties uh, with that, and uh, I think we uh, have to continue, although that uh, some of us say we cannot go on forever, I understand that. But the one of the reasons that things go very slowly is that we are working against the current. The current is that projects and the future is uh, prospected by the governments and they come top down. Let it be NSF or the European Union like that. And if enough work has been done in the Arctic uh, and in the European Union member states, then we can get something like uh, passion. But there is no uh, political base uh, to have an Atlantic passion because the Atlantic countries uh, don't cooperate about the basin which is between them. And um, so, and if you have several times, the decade of the ocean has been mentioned. I'm afraid that there is a, the decade of the ocean is a typical top down structure, which does not listen to the discussions of the scientist and the scientist don't make the breakthrough to the government that they listen to uh, the wisdom which actually scientists can provide. So that things take time and uh, things go slowly or may not turn out at all is an imminent part uh, of, of the, let's say, research times we live in. And I think uh, B2B is one of these bottom-up organizations which will have a big uh, difficulties uh, to get its voice heard because at the top, very few people uh, will listen unless we convince them. But in, before we can convince them, we need much more muscles, uh, much more concise uh, language. And, um, and the only way that we can be, be more precise and, uh, and, and strengthen our position and create an understanding is that we get enough funding for think tank meetings so that we not only hang on with our digital meetings every second week or something like this. So this is the... Uh, the first uh, and real bottleneck I, I see, but if uh, let's say um, 
a million Norwegian crowns or whatever we may get from from out of Norway, if we are lucky, is enough uh, to convince uh, the research organizations around the North Atlantic to go for something like B2B. I, I don't know, but I think it's worthwhile. Uh, it's worth to try. And uh, I stop here. Thank you. Yeah, Catherine has circulated a link to the NSF, so you're aware of that. Any other who want to take the floor here on this more general discussion? Um, Yeah, if I may just very briefly um, following up on what we just heard, um, I think especially from the social sciences perspective, that's really a problem that in the social sciences, we often tend to see things on a more local or regional scale. And it's much harder, especially for the younger researchers to actually dare to look a bit more broadly and to even look for these connections, which might be obvious from a natural sciences perspective, but um, yeah, it's often even discouraged to look beyond what you're supposed to study. Um, I've seen it in the Arctic myself that people were, let's say, interested in what's happening in the Baltic Sea from an environmental law perspective, that they would already get discouraged from looking at this because it would be away from what they were supposed to be specializing in. So I think this is really a cultural issue within the social sciences. What we can try to do um, in order to make sure that people also from outside the natural sciences um, get this interest or get a better understanding of why these connections matter. Um, for example, like the Central Atlantic connected to the Arctic and so on. Um, I think that's really a challenge of translating knowledge um, between different disciplines. Because I think this additional value that's also there for the social sciences, it's just it's, this is something which is not as immediately obvious in many social science um, research fields as it is in the natural sciences. So this might be more of an yeah, explanation problem or a, uh, I would call it a marketing problem that we have there. So it's not actually a real problem, but more cultural problem within the recipient group within social scientists. But it's, that also means it's a solvable problem. Thank you. That's an interesting observation, this difference in culture. It's, um, but it looks like uh, all of those speaking so far is that if we shall really manage to move B2B, we need to secure a better funding for us that can secure a better administration and a better outreach strategy. And as I understand, in the US, we have an NSF call that can be used. We have a call so also at the Norwegian Research Council a small problem here is that both Paul and I, we are close to our at the retiring age, so we cannot apply. <laughs> we, uh, <laughs> we need some younger ones who can um, apply, who will stay in science for at least three to four years. So um, we need some younger ones to, to sign an application Paul and I can write to the Norwegian Research Council. So that's what we are working with now. So maybe, I don't know if Kjetil can, <laughs> we can write the application and Kjetil can sign it. <laughs> I don't know from the other, um, that's a, that because that's a really important thing is to get them a substantial funding. Are you talking about a, 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 amounts that we can hire people and do and have some professional involved here in addition to what the fantastic job Jenny is doing. But we need to pay her also. She can't only do this on a voluntarily. No, what we intend to do and what Lars Otto and I have been talking about, and we know, let's say, the uh, logistically how to uh, um, shape uh, the application uh, is to get enough funding uh, to uh, secure uh, the secretary function uh, for quite some time, 50% or 40% or something like this, and that we will have um, a space for two or three uh, dedicated uh, um, think tank meetings and maybe a, a major one which would then stretch into uh, uh, well into uh, 2022. So that is what I think we can do on the meeting front um, uh, provided um, from Norway provided that um, 
the application would come through. And um, uh, Bob has things going on the US side, uh, which I don't know about. And that, of course, had to be coordinated. But um, I hope that um, uh, most of you or many of you uh, will keep going on this uh, tiring uh, um, long pathway which we have in front of us because I think we need time uh, to have success. All right. <clears throat> Any other who we'll have to voice a statement or a view here? I think if not, we can move on and look into the, um, the way we have organized it so far has been the three types of meetings. We had the planning meetings, um, the committee meetings, we have seminars, and then we have the conundrums that we have planned. So maybe that's too much of meetings. Maybe for the autumn, shall go for maybe two types of meeting that we have the, the planning meetings every 14 days, and then we have seminars where we have one or two or three people that are in, introducing into a discussion of a topic of great concern and how we can solve administrative and other problems. But then also think that when we have finished the meetings, we need to come out with a message to the wider world. We need to not only have a nice discussion, we need to maybe to produce an outreach communique um, so we can start to show that B2B is alive and is producing some thoughts here and ideas that is coming out outside this inner group in a way. I don't know if any of you have been thinking about similar way, how we can be more interactive with the wider world outside um, than just communicating within the group you have of 200 enthusiastic scientists. Any views? Um. I think a basic question to ask at this stage will be I'm looking at communication which is frequent and on a lot of different issues or something that's more substantial and or more detailed and so on um, every now and then. Like, are we talking about something like a yeah, regular output, something where people could expect, okay, in every four weeks, every eight weeks, whatever, there's a new specific output? Or would this more yeah, be okay on occasion whenever something would happen to come up? What I have been thinking about is that we need an outreach after when we had our two day, two weeks meeting or a special seminar, we, we need to come out with a message after that, summing up or an initiative. So I think that should be a more regular outreach um, based on the discussions and what we may agree upon. So I, I think that if you just leave it to be no and then, then we will, it will die. It, we have to get structured in a, in a way that we can pick up the science and the interactions between socials, natural science and politics here that is of interest for the wider audience. It's, uh, and what's going on in the North Atlantic subtropical Arctic areas. That's the... Right, well, it, it seems to me, I, I don't know how you would distribute that kind of output, except the most obvious way I think would be to use the website, but someone needs to provide some group of people or one person or different people different after different meetings needs to provide the message you know, it's fairly easy to update a web page every day or every, you know, once a week or every two weeks if it's getting viewed, right? And I don't know if there's people that are paying attention. It's a very nice framework that, that Jenny has created. I don't know if it's getting any traffic. Can, can you comment on that, Jenny? I haven't checked lately, but no, it's not really getting any, com um, any, any traffic, but that's, we're not marketing ourselves. And I think part of that is, we don't we haven't really talked about who our target audience is and for what um so are, do we have different target audiences do we need different mailing lists um and i and i also and i've said this a few times and i i don't know the answer but 
where are our stakeholders? I think they need to be on this meeting. If we're going to do what we're hoping to do, we we need the users, and and I don't think we're getting them. And so, I don't know. There's just a lot there that we're not getting, and I think the users could be people who would come to the website if we knew what to put on the website. Does that make any sense? Sorry, Jack. No, I, I think that does make sense. And I guess, you know, even if the website is not the vehicle, if, if we did some kind of a report after every seminar or after every planning meeting, we still face the same question as what do we do with it, right? I mean, it could be a really beautiful two or four page document or whatever is right, but who do you send it to? Right. And, and that's, I, I agree is that we need to identify the users that, and, you know, maybe we can say, well, everybody in all those 20 countries around the, the Atlantic should be concerned, but we're not going to reach out to all of them. Right. And, and a lot of them don't care. So, I mean, how do we identify the, the real stakeholders? Yeah, the problem with the stakeholders, uh, some of them, for example, in fisheries, which I know a little bit more about, uh, is that uh, they may not be interested. Uh, they may be interested to keep to this, let's say, old fashioned weather signs, these types of clouds give this types of wind or like that, which they have today, and will not go to the hardship uh, to connect um, really good signs, like uh, modeling, predicting, things like that. Um, uh, there. So uh, to convince them, the stakeholders, uh, um, when the stakeholders may not be interested, but should be convinced to be interested, uh, that is uh, maybe uh, one of the challenges which uh, B2B has, for example, in this field. It may be different in other fields. I don't know. But for example, I can just give you an example. Uh, you can have toxic algae blooms which kills uh, 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 50 million of Norwegian uh, fish or uh, crowns or whatever. And you have drifting models which can predict um, uh, the spread of toxic algae so that you have a precision which um, fisheries will be it, uh, affected or not. But there is no mechanisms to activate the model. The model sits there, but there is nobody who's asking for it. So um, well, that's just an example where how um, how uh, dis uh, disappointed one can be as a natural basic natural scientist to have a tool to provide benefit for the uh, for the economy and the industry and the general well being and those uh, in in the economic side are not interested. So this is a little sigh from from my side with regard to fisheries. So the stakeholders should be there, but uh, B2B has to convince them before to be interested. So that makes it uh, uh, more challenging for us. Mike, your finger, your brain mean that you have something? Um, yeah, so I, I would just say I was, involved uh i'm sorry i joined late and stuff but i i was involved yesterday in thinking about what our climate institute in washington was doing but it sort of gets to what what we're thinking about for here and it's trying to figure out i guess at, at what level of generality or specificity are we trying to position b to b to be sorry <laughs> Um, in, in the international level of things, um, you know, is it, uh, I mean, those go from there being specific projects that are funded by EU or something about particular places, you know, all the way up to um, there being things like future earth, which is sort of quite general encompassing things. I guess my my sense is sort of and and having served on SCORE, so Scientific Committee for Ocean Research, so it's driven by scientists. It's part of the scientific side of the organization of things, which is responsible for watching over, in some sense, now for sixty years or something, um, 
all the ocean projects that are funded by countries. And so it watches over, it had watched over WOS and all these other crazy things. Um, what's kind of, so I was on that for nine years. What's kind of interesting is it does a wide range of scientific projects, but it doesn't really have any regional focus organization. And, and what's interesting, I think, is that for, that for the Arctic, AMAP sort of serves that purpose. Um, it's been put together to watch over or be an integrative force for, in some sense, and whatever that new group we also heard about, of the, the scientific activities going on in the Arctic, the Arctic initiative thing that we talked about. But there doesn't seem to be anything for the Atlantic. Um, now, Atlantic, is, as Paul says, is connected to the Arctic, and both, they're both connected. But, but there doesn't really seem to be that kind of entity for, for the Atlantic, to, to be a place where all the various projects that are involved in studying the Atlantic come together and try and think in an integrated way about what their results are doing and what is missing um, and stuff as a, as a set of, of scientists or something, um, not as a set of countries coming at it or something. I mean, one has that WMO organizational structure that does things, but, but, as, a, but as a set of scientists that their questions, it sort of gets as Paul was talking about um, in, in, in that regard, that you need the scientific community thinking about the, the Atlantic Basin, broadly speaking, in a general way. So is, is that what we maybe should be aiming for, thinking that maybe in, in the world of things, there is sort of score looking at global oceans as a whole and scientific projects, but that there needs to be some regional efforts and entities. Um, there are ones for things like fisheries and, and a few other things, but, but are there ones that really encompass all that we think about in terms of trying to deal with the Atlantic going from biological to physical to chemical to everything else? Um, is, is that what we want to be? So we're more a, a, a group that tries to bring people together to think about and, and talk about the Atlantic. So you have annual conferences or something, and then probably some working groups on particular things. So it's an organizational framework for doing things. Is that something that might be created and, and might be useful in bringing PIs of all these different projects together? Um, sort of like that, that, that initiative for the Arctic. I don't know, it, it just seems we're, I don't think we figured out and, and gone, are we gonna actually try and sort of be um, a project like an IGBP project or a WMO kind of project or program? I mean, or, um, or, or are we gonna be a coordinating body or what, what might be the role we could play for the Atlantic Basin? Yeah. Um, the if I can just shortly say something, the reason that things like AMAP uh, functioned or, um, um, or projects like in the Baltic and the Mediterranean and the Black Sea is that the sea is small enough so that people figure out that they have to work together. Uh, the North Atlantic is too big so that you have an Atlantic consciousness on the sea between the continents. Everybody knows that the Baltic uh, or the Mediterranean is so small that nobody can understand and manage the region without listening to the neighbors uh, on uh, like that. So you have this circum pan understanding there. And also a politician far away from science uh, will understand that there is a need. But we do not have, uh, but we should have that Atlantic understanding, uh, a feeling that the 20 coastal states say, this is the sea which we have together. Uh, but uh, that is not the case. In some cases, like the fisheries, uh, that is the case. And that is a successful story. But in most other cases, um, 
uh, we do not have that. Uh, if, if, for example, uh, uh, for example, NATO could be a, a, a structure which would be on support of that, but they have not uh, withdrawn very much from what I understand compared to previously to do science. And also by stressing nature and using NATO as a, as a, as a let's say, a as a basis, uh, then we run into uh, problems like what we do with Cuba and the West Sahara and Morocco and West Africa and so on and so on. So they are, th that is not a good basis, but uh, uh, we la lacking this global understanding or the, let's say this not global, but uh, we lack the understanding of, of looking at the North Atlantic as one system. Um, and uh, we had to argue on the political side uh, for that. Could, could IAPSO be one, the International Association of Physical Sciences of the Ocean, sort of have a entity? I mean, they have various committees that goes up through you know, ICSU and down through IUGG and everything, um, you know, have an Atlantic focused entity that, that uh, you know, try to do that now. It is, IAPSO is sort of physical sciences of the ocean. That's the trouble. It doesn't then get into all the biological aspects and everything. So one wants to be in general and you might have to go to, there is a biological one of the ocean that SCORE has a member. I don't remember the name of the organization, but it's almost like a, a joint commission under IAPSO and IABO or something it's called. I don't remember its exact name, um, but but um, yeah, I mean, I think one might be able to, to figure out a, a place that it would actually fit in the in the set of things but uh, if i could come in here i think that um, if one looks at this from the uh, from the uh, uh, management side of how countries along the atlantic rim manage their marine resources and their marine responsibilities and marine risks then there is a large number of national institutions here in norway for instance we have the marine research institute which is, is in charge of the, the monitoring of the fish resources. And to do that, they, need, they do a lot of observations, also physical and dynamics, and they do model calculations. And you have the coastal authorities responsible for, uh, for ship planes, et cetera, and search and rescue and, uh, and that type of thing. And you have the security, uh, military security, uh, with all their interests in the marine areas. And you can go from, from uh, sector to sector, and there is an op there is a operational management structure there, which has a also has a science basis. Um, the science basis is not the same from sector to sector, mm -hmm. and and uh, traditionally they all have done, done their own thing. But with new capabilities, not least through Copernicus, in my opinion, in here in Europe, these things uh, converge and. Uh, Sooner or later, there will be one system that provide the operational basis for marine activities. And, and if you go to other countries, go to the UK, go to France, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, they will all have their governmental funded structures for how they manage their marine activities. And if you add up the observational capabilities to the science capabilities and the service capabilities, what that actually involves in these countries, you get a sum which is huge. And it's a sum of small parts, and it's a, and it is a it is a structure where, which seems to me to have the quite distance from the academic sector, which we represent here, more or less. And I think this this has this has to end in some way. One has to converge here, because that is what modern capabilities actually speak in favor of. Traditionally, you couldn't converge because things were too there were too many unknowns and too little methodological capability. But this is changing. Um, and, and, and if you are a large pr private company like, uh, like Google or, or some other ones who, who see the, sees this opportunity to actually uh, pr provide the, the sort of knowledge basis for marine uh, governance, marine activities, there is a, 
there is a tremendous value in it. And and I think that here we sit as a science community and we don't we don't engage ourselves in this in this boundary discussion. And that is what we have to do in my opinion, because that is where the future is. Yeah, I think but, that we yeah. yeah, please go on, I used to finalize. No, no, I think I think this is a this is very difficult for the Marian part because it's not done before. Yeah. Uh, but it, I think it has to be done. It it will happen over the next next decade or so. I'm quite sure because the 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 Earth system modeling observational capability grows so fast that that these things uh, will will emerge because they are they are in a sense risk reducing and and they are they are value creating. But it's 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 a, an activity which is not driven. It is it is not an academic activity. It is a it is a societal activity where where academia should take a responsibility, but not not as not as paper producing individual scientists, but in a joint effort to, to actually uh, fulfill this mission. Yes, I like that the discussion here and. Um... Just to go back to the Arctic, when we started the Arctic cooperation, I think we had only one international cooperation that was functioning when we started this in the early 90s, and that was the Meteorological Observations, WMO, that covered the whole Arctic. And when we created AMAP, we had a white sheet of paper, and we could stimulate the whole thing by saying everything is voluntarily, and you can bring in things that you find important for yourself, but we have to bring it up to the policy relevant recommendations. So by that we managed to get science to have a bringing up top science that had a value for the societies, for the health of the indigenous people, for the pollution, for the climate change, etc. So I think that for the Atlantic, we have a much more complicated picture when we start so many different organizations, different countries than we had in the Arctic. And how do you going to interlink all of them? to produce science that is of great uh, use for the societies and the business and the people in these 20 countries. That's a tremendous challenge to try to do that and to get all of these strong organizations you already have in place around the Ar Atlantic for natural science, for med science, social science, etc. cetera. So another organization that I think formed less than 20 years ago called the World Ocean Council. So people were talking about who were the stakeholders. And I, I think that's an entity that has been working very hard to grow and be composed mainly of stakeholders and industrial groups and shipping companies and all kinds of things. So, you know, one could almost imagine, the, I mean, SCORE's executive board is put together in a very strange way. It has some that are sort of officially coming from the science community and then it has representatives on it from various international organizations. Uh, YAPSO and YABO, the biological organization, and I was the representative from YAMAS, which is the atmospheric science community. It was very interesting to learn oceanography as the only atmospheric person there for, for a while. But uh, you know, it's trying to figure out how could you create some entity that would be a coordinating entity to bring things together. What's nice is that YAPSO and YABO both have international scientific conferences, so they sort of take care of that part. But what they don't have that sort of, I don't think, um, an Atlantic focus that is bringing it across disciplines and everything together and bringing all the groups together. So it, it would be interesting to think about where where this entity should be placed in sort of that structure if we can and what what that might help us figure out what we might try and accomplish. I think one should go to uh, to the uh, the uh, institutions that have the societal responsibilities for operating. The various aspects of of, uh, of, uh, of of exploitation of ocean resources or ship shipping, etc. We should go go there and see what kind of mechanisms do they have for involvement of the services that underpin their activities, and what what kind of activities they have to 
reduce the risks in their in 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 carrying out their missions uh, to see what kind of structures do they have and is it possible to to use those structures to sort of evolve evolve a coupling of the applications and the and the science because because unfortunately i think that ICSU, for instance and the additional disciplinary global uh, research organizations like uh, that were created 100 years ago those those have served, served many good purposes but but they are filled with uh, i think uh, in general one may say they are filled with traditional old-fashioned academics that do not see their role in in life uh, in this in this way they see their role in life to 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 do research and it could be fundamental research write the papers and, and they are they do not have the legacy uh, uh, they don't they they don't consider the, their legal legacy responsibility as important. Uh, and I think that B2B should, that is the real essence of B2B, it should really see its responsibility to provide a legacy that is risk reducing and, and the resource saving and, and peace creating <laughs> along the Atlantic Rim, which is a societal role. Yes, good tree. Clever statements. Um, time is running. It's uh, half past five, so we still have half an hour. Um, do we have anything we can sum up here now um, and put on a paper? Maybe we can challenge some of you to write uh, some of the good uh, things you have uh, already spelled out. If you can write it into some pieces and we can try to see if we can try to produce a document um, highlighting what we would see B2B to develop and how we can do it which international organization should be really try to link in into this process. Um, and of course, uh, we're going back to what we talked in the first half over, and that is the financing. Coming back to the potential financial resources also from the private and other businesses that could be of interest here. Jenny, do you want I can, to say I can write that as I've said. Yeah. yeah. And I think yeah. if you can try a challenge Mike and uh, Mark and, and Susan and Stefan to write something, that would be great. And the others. Jenny, I think I thought you. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. Um, uh, Oystein, I think it'd be great if you did that, because I think that's something that we definitely need, especially what are these institutions that you're talking about? Um, I sort of feel like we're going a bit around in circles where we're trying to figure out where our organization needs to fit at the same time we're trying to figure out what we want it to do. Um, I think maybe we need some decisions instead of to just kind of, I feel like all these, we're just talking in circles and nothing is happening. And so maybe what we need to do is start small, um, pick one of those 11 or 10 topics that we highlighted before and make B two B I do what we want it to do, but just with one. So we start small, set up the the process of what we would like to have done, where we bring in the stakeholders and we have some discussions and some think tank meetings on just one topic first, because I don't think we can, you know, we're talking about creating another WCRP or some huge organization, and I don't think we can do that until we have some kind of track record that shows what we can do in this new mm -hmm. way of thinking. So. So maybe it's baby steps that we need. Funny that I'm saying this as, as you know, I'm usually the one that wants to do everything all at once, but I think maybe we need to take a few steps back and, and come up with a B2BI plan for five to 10 years on you know, where can we start small? What are some little things we could do? Um, and then where would we like to eventually get? But, but I think we need to kind of concentrate a little bit because we're sort of all over the place and, and nothing's really getting done. Sorry. Thank you. Good observation. I would just like to make an observation. I mean, I agree with everything that Jenny just said, but um, in the going around in circles at times, we're actually like going in completely different directions in the last hour. And so, you know, we're trying to think about examples of organizations that exist that we want to be like, or that maybe would be our umbrella organization where we could fit in but early on the point was made that a lot of these organizations are very top down and uh 
and supposedly B2BI was unique because it was bottom up. So do we really want to slot into the alphabet soup of all these existing organizations or are we looking for a completely new model? And I, I don't know the answer to that, but uh, I mean, we can learn from what these other groups have done. But certainly, Lars Otto, I think your example of AMAP starting with a blank space when it was created, but it was also mandated by the Arctic Council, right? I mean, it had a sponsor right from the start. It was not really a bottom-up initiative from a bunch of scientists. It was a bunch of uh, governments that said, we need to do this together, right? Am I misremembering the history? It was a good mixture. It was a good initiative from Gorbachev and the Finnish Minister of Foreign Affairs for sure, but then they involved uh, the science people early to bring in what should be the priorities. So it was an, a top-down initiative, yes, but the science community got a very strong influence on how to design what should be done. And um, so, and that's that was easy in that time because everything everyone agreed, yes, we have to get down the military tension in, in the North and we have to work together and bring up the social life and the economy of the North and protect the environment. So everyone could see what we should do and therefore needed science to come up in this way. So, well, I don't think that we shall try to go into any of the existing organizations or as you said, we, we, are, we have to try to create something new here for the Atlantic and, but we have to use, not duplicate what already exists. I think that's also part of this, what we are struggling to see what's already out there and we can benefit from. So, so if I may, there, there, I mean, there is the governmental side of it, and there is the scientific side that comes up through IUGG, that, that comes up as uh, through the academies of science, and is the science community putting it up. And then there are entities in between. IPCC is sort of that way in some sense. It, it ended up being responsible to the UN Framework Convention, which is governments, but the IPCC is sort of supposed to be mainly scientific coming up. It, it's gotten hung up, I think, in putting out massive assessments every seven years or something. But, but uh, and what, what to, to be responsive to what Oyston was sort of talking about, you need a much more flexible entity, but it's, but it, 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 it's something that's in between that it somehow has some groups that it's going to report to of stakeholders that are governments that can decide things and have money to do things. But it's coming up from the scientific community focused on science issues in a particular, um, you know, in, in our case, in a particular ocean basin, the North Atlantic or something, um, IPCC choosing a much larger issue. Um, so, I mean, I think there are precedents for those kinds of organizations. The question is, do they, are they operating in an effective way? And, and I mean, I think many scientists feel IPCC has gotten sort of too overly structured perhaps in, in having to do its assessments that way and isn't providing the kind of ongoing feedback that, that would help various groups and be responsive, which is what I think Oyster was talking about is what, what we need and I think is right in what we tried to set up in the US National Assessment, the Congress mandated, oh, put out a report every four years as if that's gonna be what helps make the, con our, the country, the United States be responsive on an ongoing way to climate change. I mean, it won't. Uh, I mean, you need sort of, you, you need a integrated a scientific entity or some, I mean a process or something that is feeding back through. If it worked well in our in the U.S. Uh, state climatology programs or whatever, but but uh, it, it needs something. I, I, it is a struggle to figure out what that should be in between that we want to be. Thank you. I would like to say something about going in circles. Uh, I understand very well that we go in circles. I can see that myself, but maybe it's because I'm older that I don't bother so much to go in circles because uh, in Norwegian, there's a saying is that uh, the pathway is created while you walk. So by walking and have the endurance to walk and take the time, um, 
uh, I think we may cover some ground which not has been covered before because it's complicated. And if I would like to make, a, a, let's say, a paint an, um, an abstract painting, um, I would not say, well, let me start somewhere. And I would start in the right corner down there to make a little thing. I'm not sure that I will finish the big uh, picture because I will not get out of the corner because that's the one which I have realized now. So I'm personally not so much concerned about um, uh, the circling and the talking uh, and uh, the little concrete progress which we make. What I'm more concerned about is that uh, we over time uh, lose our um, uh, energy and lose our participants and so on. So at the end of uh, this spring and looking forward into the autumn and the planning of the autumn, I wonder what we can do to, uh, for example, to um, reactivating uh, the many people which are not routinely lately uh, participating, uh, making sure that we get more uh, scientific uh, uh, fields uh, into the arena and find a format that we, uh, in a productive manner, uh, keep on going at least one term till, uh, to, uh, not till uh, one more term. So um, I think uh, this is, a, uh, personally, I think this is a very productive uh, way of communication, but it takes time and endurance. I think you're right, and it's a it's a good say from the Norwegian that the things are coming while you're walking and talking. <laughs> We're passing the same topic several times, and then suddenly you see the solid. I mean, I mean, a good example of of a kind of problem where there would be input that might be useful to countries is a result of this disaster that we've had in Florida and the U.S. with the building collapse. Hmm. Um, I mean, I have a Actually, it's an old college classmate of mine who recently made a comment. He's a, well, he's, I guess, a coastal geographer from with the University of Miami, who basically sort of had a statement that I think appeared in The Guardian um, that, that uh, was saying this kind of problem of the structural integrity uh, at the base of buildings is a problem that's going to be faced by all coastal countries as sea level rises. Yes, that's what and, I, I also mean, thought. <laughs> yeah, I mean, everybody's going to be facing this thing. And, and Florida, Southern Florida geology is limestone. Mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, it's like building on a sponge or Swiss cheese or something. And, and you can just erode, things can get eroded below. That's why they have houses that sink and everything, sinkholes and everything down there and this can happen below buildings and and you go my heavens that's just going to be it's a tremendous challenge or something where where scientific insight and understanding needs to be brought to bear to to stakeholders who build along coastlines and stuff um there, there, i'm sure there's just a lot of examples we can pull from that set of eight or ten or whatever the th number was that, that Jenny was saying to pull out some examples where, where we try and sort of give illustrations of what, where a role can be played and, and that having some entity that is helping coordinate and make people aware of it and become a resource for that is needed. Right. So in a kind of uh, summing up, if you say that we, we really have to spell out what type of organization structure we would like to have for B2BI. So if we get inputs from you and we can put um, when Bob is back again from and have the energy, we can try to write that a, a short piece of paper that structure that easily so people will easily can understand uh, what B2BI is organized. And then in addition, we have to plan the autumn. Um, and we've continued with um, bi-weekly seminars. Um, people have found that to be useful and interesting. If you bring up topics of great interest for a wider audience, we shall do that. 
And if we then have seminars, maybe not uh, two types of seminars, the conundrums and we take one type and we can have invite experts to present one or two or three, depending on the topics. That could be of interest for a wider audience, um, not only for a small group. Um, and of course, we need to find a way, how can we have an outreach that is beyond um, passive things loading up on the website, which is good. But as Jenny said, she don't see any communication here and interactions. That's, um, so we have a challenge here, how we can reach an outer area and more people. So if we can get some feedbacks from you during the summer on these topics that we have listed in the paper and we have discussed it today, that will help a lot for structuring um, the work forward. And um, also what we shall put on the agenda for the autumn and to discuss related to the organizations, to the science of the Atlantic, to the economy of the at Atlantic countries, etc. And if you see any other matters you would like to see discussed, you are most welcome to provide your inputs and anytime. In the next few days, uh, and by discussing with Lars Otto and Bob and Jenny, I will uh, uh, create a, um, a time frame or a, 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 I will make a, a map or a, 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 a define the dates when we are going to have our meetings from starting on the 1st of uh, September uh, to the 1st of uh, December three months. Uh, so I will uh, look at my calendar and calendars and, and agree on what kind of uh, dates we have. And then we can communicate that uh, map to everybody like we had for the spring term. So um, we will uh, take a break until the uh, 1st of September from today and then go on for three months uh, into the autumn. But that doesn't stop the communication between us. So the emails no. and everything is open running every time, every day. <laughs> Are there any comments to the 1st of September as the start point for the new term? Is it too early, too late? Um, usually uh, August is the uh, month where most of the Europeans are uh, in holiday on holidays. So before the later for late August, uh, you can usually not, usually not start. But I thought that first of the September, which is a Wednesday, could be a good date. Uh, yeah, American holidays tend to go sometimes to Labor Day, which is the first Monday in September. Um, hmm. So just a few okay, days later, would... but but many schools are now starting before Labor Day and starting in September or even late August. So hmm. you're probably right that September first would be. Oh, so the would be um, fine. Yeah. I mean, usually that holiday uh, for for work in America is you know the Friday or Saturday through the Monday. So I would assume that Wednesday would be okay. Okay. Uh, yes. Okay. Yes. So it is not uh, Labor Day is not on Monday, the 6th of September, but it is in uh, late August. No, no, it is. It is the 6th of September. It's late. Yeah. Right. But starting on the 1st okay. should be fine. Starting on, yeah, the 1st should be fine. Okay. That's good to know. Any other topics you would like to raise? We have still some 15 minutes set aside. Looks like people are exhausted. We have the heat in Oslo. <laughs> Not the same as in Seattle and further north in Canada. Oh, we have only so Yeah. I was just saying, Paul, you can explain your shirt to us. It looks like you're going tropical or something. Yeah, no, I, I'm well going done, to. Uh, it's, it's, uh, yeah. yes. Kyrgyzstan. <laughs> no, I'm not going tropical. No, no. It was uh, bought in Bermuda. I worked uh, for a year in Bermuda many years ago and uh, was there for a visit. 
I was there in Bermuda when they started the Bermuda Atlantic Time Series. Mm. So um, at the very start of BATS, I was there. So this is the only tropical uh, connection, but it's inside the Atlantic, and it's uh, it's I, I even was, part I, of I, the it's uh, even part of the acronym which we have. I, I was also that. wondering what the structures were that were behind Oyston's left shoulder, but. He's now yeah. off the field and probably the corner of his house. <laughs> no, 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 it was beyond the corner of his house. It looked yeah. like some coastal structure or something. Yeah. Could be. Yes. All right. I shall not uh, keep you too long. It's um it's been a good discussion and um we're gonna have a discussion with Jenny and Paul and, and Bob and come up with a record from the meeting here and the plan for the autumn as soon as possible. And if you have any good ideas, you're welcome to provide them anytime. Um, so thank you for a good um, discussion this um, afternoon, this morning for some of you. And have a nice summer holiday. And uh, see you again in 1st of September, if not before. All right, thank you. Have a nice yeah. day. Bye-bye.